Hi, I'm Rusty Komori, and this is Beyond the Lines. We are broadcasting live from the beautiful ThinkTech Hawaii TV studio in the Pioneer Plaza in downtown Honolulu. This show is based on my book, also titled Beyond the Lines, and it's about leadership, creating a superior culture of excellence, and building winning teams. My special guest today was the chief of police of our Honolulu Police Department from 1998 to 2004 and he served as a police officer for a total of 40 years. He is Chief Lee Donahue, and today we are going beyond law enforcement. Hey, Chief Lee, great to see you. Well, thanks for having me on the show. Well, welcome to the show. It's an honor having you here. Yeah. Now, I want to know, Chief, when you were a young boy, did you always want to be a police officer? Uh, there were two professions I really wanted to be in. One was a pilot. Okay. And the other one was to be a police officer. Wow. Yeah, me too. When I was really young, I wanted to be a pilot. Yeah. <laughs> police, I think it was just, you know, too dangerous for me. Right, right. What ethnicity are you? I'm uh, half Korean and half Irish. So your mom is from Korea. My mom was a picture bride. Oh, wow. And uh, she came to Hawaii in, I think, 1918. Okay. And <clears throat> married to her first husband. Yeah. And then they, uh, they were living in the Palama area, and then she had four children, and then her husband passed away unexpectedly. Okay. So <clears throat> then she opened a store, and that's when she met my dad. Oh, okay. Now, Chief, what schools did you attend? Oh. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> uh, I, I first went to Waikiki Elementary. Okay. And it was... Adjacent to Thomas, where Thomas Jefferson is now. Yeah. And then uh, from there, I went to Lincoln School because in those days, you had an English standard system. So if you wanted to go up to an English standard high school, which would, would have been Roosevelt, yeah. you'd have to get into the system. So I went to Lincoln, which was in the system. So from Lincoln, you go to Stevenson and then to Roosevelt. Oh, okay. And that was the English standard system. <laughs> <laughs> and... Uh, <clears throat> So I went to Lincoln, and in the fifth grade, my mom felt I needed a, a male role model. She and my dad had already been divorced. Okay. So they shipped me to live with my older sister and her husband. Uh, his name was Glenn Kaizoji. He yeah. was a Japanese-American, uh, born and raised in California, Los Angeles. Couldn't have asked for a better role model. I mean, he was interned in uh, Camp Manzanar. Wow. You know, and I mean, he, he had a hard life, but uh, <clears throat> I think what was good about it, he had a, a gardening route, and that's how he uh, you know, supported his family. And he had three children, of course, married to my sister. But I used to go with him to help him on his route. And, you know, and I learned a lot. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. He taught me how to fish. He taught me how to do a lot of things that I couldn't ask for a better role model. Sure. And when I was about 14, I came back to Honolulu, and I went to Washington Intermediate, then St. Louis, and then back to McKinley, and I finished up at McKinley High School. Great. And what college did you go to? I went to Chaminade University. Nice. And graduated from there. So, Chief, you and your wife, Lucy, yes. how did you guys meet? We met in church. Really? Oh, uh, yeah. St. Luke's Church, uh, up there on Judge Street. Yeah. So... <clears throat> She and her twin sister, you know, would was go to the church also. And my cousin and I would sit behind them. And then when you uh, kneel down to pray, yeah. Yeah, we would be tickling their feet because <laughs> <laughs> the feet were coming back. But that's how we met. <laughs> I like hearing that, mm -hmm. tickling the feet. Yeah. <laughs> so, Chief, tell me about your family. My family is, um, of course, my mother from Korea. Yeah. And... Uh, <clears throat> She came here as a picture bride and, and raised the first family, and then I came along. And then my dad was, uh, it's funny because he was orphaned. Okay. Uh, my grandparents, his parents, passed away within a week of each other from the influenza that was going out throughout the country at that oh. time. So when he came of age, he uh, joined the Navy and got shipped out to Pearl Harbor. And then he took his discharge there, was working at Pearl Harbor. 
And then, like, I guess I don't know why he was shopping down by my mother's store, but he met my mom. Wow. All things happened from there. <laughs> I like hearing those things yeah. about family. Yeah. Now, Chief, a lot of people know that you are into karate, but mm -hmm. not everybody knows that you're a 10th degree black belt in mm -hmm. karate. Mm -hmm. How did that all start? Well, <clears throat> when I was 14, I, I was uh, involved with jujitsu. Okay. And uh, then when I went into the police force, I joined the police judo team. And then there was a shooting up on Pali Highway at the Pali, and our leader was wounded. So, and I was getting transferred out to Pro City. So when I went out there, I had a friend that was teaching karate. Oh. He was also a police officer, probably one of my best friends. And he became my instructor and started from there. Now, 10th degree black belt, that's the, that's the highest? Yes. Oh, so impressive. <laughs> A lot of years. Well, I need you to be my bodyguard. <laughs> now, Chief, let's talk about your amazing journey as, in law enforcement. How did that part begin with you? Well, like I said, when I was young, I, was a, I wanted to be the pilot or a police officer. Yeah. And uh, after graduation from high school, got married, and I was working in construction. Okay. But then the time came uh, that you could apply for the police department. You had to be 21. I uh, <clears throat> applied for two apartment departments. So one was the Los Angeles Police Department and Honolulu. And I passed both tests. So I had to decide which department I wanted to join. So I asked Lucy, well, are you willing to go to Los Angeles? Because I, I thought, you know, living in Los Angeles before, I thought it'd be neat going back as a police officer. Yeah. And uh, she said, no, I want to stay in Hawaii. <laughs> so, so we stayed in Hawaii. So Lucy made the decision. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, she did. Now, as you were rising through the ranks as a police officer, how was that experience for you? You know, it was a, <clears throat> it was a great experience. I can tell you that uh, I had just bought a house. We were living in Pacific Palisades, and we had three children at that time. And we were getting paid a total of $466 a month. Oh. I, I don't know how we did it. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I got to give credit to Lucy. She, you know, she handled the monies, but we struggled. You know? wow. But <clears throat> that was a tough time. And at one point, I wanted to quit. You know, I wanted to go back to construction because I knew the money was good there. And then I decided, no, just stick it out. In fact, my first year of my pay raise, I never forgot it. Oh, my paycheck was a dollar less than, than the previous paycheck. Really? So, so the pay raise, everything went to uh, taxes. Wow. So anyway, I just stuck it out. And, uh, and then, then things started to improve. I, I got to work special duty a lot. And, uh, and thank God for special duty. I know the police officers today depend on it also. Yeah, the overtime. Yeah, well, you know, you make some extra money, you know. And uh, if, if it wasn't for that, I don't know how we'd survive. But well, then we moved on, and then, uh, you know, things got better financially in the police department, and, and then I just kept going up. I, I never thought I'd, I'd be a sergeant. Wow. You know, I just thought, I mean, those days, sergeants were like gods. You, know? <laughs> uh, you, you go to work, and they say, we have enough guys, you go home. <laughs> and they send you home on count time, you know. Yeah. And you, had, you had no say about it. Wow. So, <clears throat> but anyway, it, it, was, it was good coming up. I, I had a good experience, and I had good leaders. So, Chief, you became Chief of Police in 1998. Why, why were you so successful as the chief during that time? I think it was my philosophy of uh, <clears throat> being collaborative in my leadership. Yeah. Uh, making sure that everything the officers <clears throat> needed, not wanted, but needed. And of course, they want a lot of things, but you can't give them everything. Yeah. But whatever they needed, we try to you know, give to them. So that they would see that the uh, upper administration, you know, was really trying to, to support them. Yeah. 
and along those same lines to build build a bridge between the community and the police department. Yeah, and so that was that was uh, <clears throat> I think the biggest thing that we could do, and one of the biggest things that I, I achieved as chief was to bring in accreditation of the department, which took us three years. Yeah. You know? well, and one of the biggest things that I remembered was, I mean, safety was a big issue that, that you really wanted to address. Right. And uh, so one of the first things we did in, you know, along those lines of safety was to bring in the, uh, the bulletproof vests. Yeah. So the, the question was, do they have to, it was it mandatory to wear when you're on duty? And I had to make that decision. And I know it was unpopular, but I said, you have to wear it. You have to wear it when you're on duty. And lo and behold, three weeks after that decision, there was an officer walking up to a domestic dispute. The guy came out of the door, shot the officer right in the chest. But because he had his vest, he survived the shooting. Jeez. You know, so that was, so I knew I made the right decision. Yeah, of course, yeah. Now, you also started um, the Kickstart Karate Foundation mm -hmm. or association. Right. Tell me about how that all started. Uh, back in the early 1980s, Chief Mike Nakamura uh, sent me to Japan uh, to learn about the Koban system. Koban system is a system used by the Japanese police where they have what they call police boxes uh, strategically placed throughout the city. And they have a, a light over the station. So okay. if you see the light, you know that you can go and get help there. So we were sent to uh, study that. And these, the Japanese had done their research on me, and they knew that I was involved in the martial arts. So every station that I went to, they took me to the, the dojo, and they would put on a demonstration. You know? But I learned, I learned there that... <clears throat> The police officers, to be a police officer in Japan, to graduate from the academy, you have to have your black belt in either judo or kendo by the time you graduate. So <clears throat> with that, when they get assigned to their different stations, they would invite the kids in from the community to learn judo yeah. or, or kendo. And this was their way of, of building their rapport with the kids, uh, teaching them character, self-discipline, and as well as, as making them all, you know, just good community members. What are some of the principles and some of the things you have the, the kids recite? We have uh, 16 bylaws in it. We, uh, uh, everyone has to recite a bylaw. And, and they're, they're simple bylaws that we live by. Um, one of them is uh, I'll, uh, never use any profane language. Yeah. And I think that's important, and we tell the kids that. As I say, if there's one thing that disturbs me is if I'm walking through a shopping center and there's a group of young people and they're using profanity, and it's, it's just disturbing, you know? Yeah. So I, I would want my students to be, to be, you know, good, decent people and know the difference between right and wrong. What are, what are some of the other uh, interesting things that you have them recite? on a daily basis? Well, we have uh, <clears throat> never say in one house what you hear in another. Yeah. <laughs> never speak ill of the absent. Good. You know, never misuse these arts or yeah. use them for self-gain. You know, th those are some of the real, real interesting. And uh, protect the innocent, forgive the ignorant, yeah. and tame only the wild. However, let us tame ourselves first before we tame the wild. Words of wisdom. Yeah. Love hearing those. <laughs> Now, you're also the Director of Security for Securitas. I am. Wow. And, and you're the president of Crime Stoppers? Yes. Are you busier now than you've ever been? I'm busy. <laughs> I'm busy. How's everything with Crime Stoppers uh, nowadays? Crime Stoppers is good. We, uh, you know, I just became president, and we're uh, redoing our bylaws, and we have some new members that have come on, some members that will help us uh, to help spread Crime Stoppers and, and help with uh, get you on the, the intent is really to catch all those who are wanted, right? Yeah, for sure. Yeah, so, but you need a board to do that, and we have a good board. Well, you as president, that's, that's awesome. <laughs>
Now, Chief, we're going to take a quick break, and then when we come back, we're going to continue going beyond law enforcement. Okay. You are watching Beyond the Lines on Think Tech Hawaii with my special guest, Chief Lee Donahue. We will be back in 60 seconds. Hey, aloha. My name is Andrew Lanning. I'm the host of Security Matters Hawaii, airing every Wednesday here on Think Tech Hawaii, live from the studios. I'll bring you guests. I'll bring you information about the things in security that matter to keeping you safe, your coworkers safe, your family safe, to keep our community safe. Uh, we want to teach you about those things in our industry that, you know, may be a little outside of your experience. So please join me because security matters. Aloha. <laughs> Aloha, I'm Cynthia Sinclair. And I'm Tim Apicella. We are hosts here at Think Tech Hawaii, a digital media company serving the people of Hawaii. We provide a video platform for citizen journalists to raise public awareness in Hawaii. We are a Hawaii nonprofit that depends on the generosity of its supporters to keep on going. We'd be grateful if you go to thinktechhawaii.com and make a donation to support us now. Thanks, Thanks so much. So much. Welcome back to Beyond the Lines on Think Tech Hawaii. My special guest today is an extraordinary leader who was the chief of police of our Honolulu Police Department from 1998 to 2004. He is Chief Lee Donahue, and today we are going beyond law enforcement. Chief, in my book, Beyond the Lines, a, a big part of it is about leadership. And I mean, you're an extraordinary leader. What do you feel the best leaders do? What are the qualities of the best leaders, in your opinion? <laughs> that they listen to their people ah. and uh, find out what their needs are yeah. and their wants. I mean, it's good to know what they want also. Yeah. But there is a definite uh, separation between the two. And trying to, try to satisfy their needs and do it on a daily basis, uh, that, that's, that's to me the most important part of a leader. And making it known how you're trying to, to uh, <clears throat> get, get their needs met. Because it's important to them. Because I know that what we, when we did surveys, the farther you go away from your core unit, like if you're in a sector, the farther you go away, the less trust you have of those above you. Yeah. And it's just, it's just something that goes with any organization. So knowing that, you have to be able to come down and, and provide, provide what they need. I think you have to be able to listen to them. You should never, I'll give you an um, example. I, I had this, I was on a way to a meeting and I was walking through the hallways and it was, I was gonna be late, but this officer stopped me in the hallway and said, Chief, can I ask you a question? And I could have told him, I'm not down, I, I'm late for a meeting, but. Yeah. It was important for him to ask me, so I said, sure, ask me the question. And, and I answered his question, uh, and at least it satisfied his need at that time. Yeah. You know? But you have to do that as a leader. You have to, you, you know, you can't stop that. Yeah, and empathy is huge, I mm. mean, with your team and mm. building trust, like you said, and mm. respect and loyalty. Right. So, you know, and that's what a, a leader has to do, I mean, really. And it's not easy, you know, it's yeah. not easy because there's so many demands on a leader, but you have to understand, <clears throat> without your people, nobody's going to follow you. That's right, yeah. yeah. Now, you know, and you had, I mean, you're the leader of the entire Honlu Police Department. Mm -hmm. What were your top priorities with your team of police officers? Well, one was uh, <clears throat> safety. Yeah, for sure. Safety first, and we covered that. And the other thing was accreditation. Yeah. Um, and so we went for accreditation because accreditation would show that we met the standards of, uh, of uh, law enforcement and that we could, we could um, match ourselves with any major city police department. So a major city police department in the United States at that time, I'm sure it's about the same, it has a population of at least 500,000. Wow. And of that, there are probably 55 major city police departments. Of the 55, 
there were only 12 that were accredited. Oh. So we became the 13th. Oh, that's great. Yeah. So, you know, it was, a, it was something that we could do because you can use that uh, for, to the good of the officers. Uh, the reason for that is when you get sued, you can show that through your accreditation process, you have met the standards of law enforcement. Yeah. And that goes a long way in helping the officers. Chief, let's talk about Chief Susan Ballard. And she's very well respected. I mean, she's taking the department in a great direction. Mm -hmm. Why do you like her so much? Susan uh, <clears throat> worked for me. Yeah. And, uh, and I saw her coming up through the ranks. And if I'm correct, I think I was the last one to promote her to major. Oh. You know, but <clears throat> she, she knew how to take care of her people. And that was one of her strongest things that I saw in her as she was coming up. And uh, <clears throat> I remember uh, one time she was in finance and I was starting Kickstart. Okay. And, you know, I was getting a lot of flack because people say, how come you're using uh, department money to do this karate? I said, no, it's not about just karate. It's about working with youth and uh, at-risk youth. Yeah. So she had the foresight to tell me, Chief, why don't we just put this in as a line item budget in the budget, and then you don't have to justify this every year. <laughs> I mean, that's the way she was thinking. Yeah, and that's awesome. And I always thought, I thought of that. I remember uh, she lost the officer in her command and how that impacted her. But, you know, she was able to carry through. And when I saw her make chief, I was so happy for her. Yeah, sure. We all are. <laughs> now, what do you see as her biggest challenge right now as chief? I think the vacancies that she has to fill okay. is one. And getting the support of the city administration, which I think she has. It seems that uh, Mayor Caldwell is, is behind her. So, but... You know, without the uh, city support, it, it's hard to get funding that you need. Yeah. Um, I remember one time when Chief Nakamura was the chief, uh, the mayor at that time, he was upset with uh, Chief Nakamura and wouldn't, wouldn't let us buy cars to, to replace the old cars, and we were driving junks out there. Officers were getting upset with us, <laughs> you know. So, so, the, so it's good that the mayor supports you. Yeah. You know, but yet I see that she holds her lines, you know, and she, she makes her demands known, and she does very well. Awesome. Now, Chief, have you had any major adversities in your life that you have to overcome? <clears throat> I think, uh, in answer to your question, in my youth, it was not having a dad, mm -hmm. you know, but I had great mentors. Yeah. That took care of me, my brother-in-law, my brothers. Uh, <clears throat> then going on in life, I think uh, there was this one time when uh, I was trying to get uh, defibrillators. There were 80 defibrillators uh, available through the city council, but the union was fighting me on this. They, uh -huh. they said, no, you're stepping into a diff different realm of work. And I said, no, I don't think so. I think our job is to save lives, and this will help us do it. So the union said, well, okay, if you can get volunteers to do it, we won't object. So the sign-up list was going very slow, and Boise Correa was in charge of the project at that time. So he and I went into a, a competition, and it just happened. He had the very first defibrillator that we had. He had it in the trunk of his car. <clears throat> and I went through a through exercise and when I went down uh, when I got through I actually collapsed and I was uh, having a I was getting a uh, having a heart attack oh, so wow. uh, what happened is uh, boys you got the defibrillator out of the car because they were they were uh, giving me a CPR but it wasn't working because I was turning purple ambulance was on the way but he was able to get that uh, defibrillator out of his car, and they hooked it up to me, and boom. And they said, as soon as they, they turned it on, you could see the color coming back in me. So I survived. I survived that. I, went, I landed up in the hospital. 
And uh, when I came out, I had no problems with people signing up for defibrillators. <laughs> so today we have defibrillators in a lot of the cars out in the patrol. Wow, the, the irony the, you know, that you wanted it and it ultimately saved your life. Right. Yep. Wow. Now, I mean, everywhere we go, there's defibrillators. Right, exactly. And uh, I think a lot, because of that incident, a lot of, uh, I know the United Airlines was told they had to put defibrillators on their planes. Yeah. And uh, so I, I heard a lot of stories afterwards. Oh, thank you for sharing that. Mm -hmm. Chief, what, do you, what has been the greatest advice you've ever received in your life? Be nice. Yeah. Yep. Simple. Be nice. Why can't everybody be nice? Right. Right. <laughs> Everyone's capable of that. Right. And I, I used to tell the recruits when they're graduating, I'm going to leave you with two words that will affect your career. And these two words are be nice. Yeah. You know? so, <clears throat> and I think that's very important. Yeah, I totally agree. I second that. <laughs> I want to know, what are your thoughts about the homeless crisis? I mean, it's not just here, but it's nationwide. But, you know, what are your thoughts about it and how the police officers, uh, sometimes it seems like they're, they're handcuffed in what they can do. Right. <clears throat> and it's a, it's, a, it's a tough problem. And one that I don't think we'll ever see the answer to fully. Yeah. I think the answer to homelessness is the government getting involved and providing, providing uh, living spaces for these people. And I, and you, see, you see it going on, but it's not enough. Uh, as I understand it, you know, people have said that uh, a, a lot of families are one paycheck away from being homeless. Yeah. You know, so and that's, it seems to be growing, and no matter how much the government tries to, to place them, the problem grows even bigger. Well, the police officers in dealing with this, they're charged with either moving them along or making sure they're following the rules wherever they're at. You know? And it's, it's, it's a tough job because, you know, who wants to be homeless? Yeah. You know? But, I mean, it, it, if you've ever dealt with uh, homeless people, you know, you, you'll find that they're a little bit different. A lot of them are really good families that have met tough times, but then there are others that don't want to, don't care. They just don't want to be told what to do yeah. and have to live by rules and regulations. And so they like it in the parks or on the sidewalks. You know? Chief, in, in closing, I want to ask you one more thing. Mm -hmm. What gives you fulfillment? Well, I think whenever I, uh, I look at Look at Lucy. Um, <clears throat> she's been such a big part of my life. Yeah. So, um, so whenever I see, you know, her, her happy, then you know that gives me fulfillment. You're getting me. <laughs> You're getting me all. <laughs> <clears throat> I'm sorry, but yeah, it's just so. Uh, but that's what gives me fulfillment. I love you know, that. Seeing, seeing that my family is uh, doing well, you know, and uh, help them if they're in trouble, and if they're not, then you just support them. I love it. Thanks for your insights, and thank you for sharing that about Lucy as well. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Chief. Right. And thank you for watching Beyond the Lines on Think Tech Hawaii and a special thank you to my clothing sponsor, Iolani Incorporated. For more information, please visit RustyKomori.com and my book is available on Amazon and Barnes and & Noble. I hope that Chief Lee and I will inspire you to create your own superior culture of excellence and to find your greatness and help others find theirs. Aloha.